Hey everyone and welcome to the Retro channel and today we are converting a PAL NES to NTSC. Now why would you want to do this? Well there are a few reasons I can think of. First of all is the games library. Much like a lot of consoles of this era there were far more releases in NTSC markets than there were in PAL. According to Wikipedia there are 1,387 officially licensed games for the NES and Famicom. 672 of those were exclusive to Japan, which is also NTSC, and 186 were exclusive to North America, again NTSC, and only 19 were exclusive in PAL countries. And in terms of those 19 exclusives, there's probably better ports on other systems anyway. We can also see that North America had about double the amount of power releases, and we can also see Japan has about three times as many. Of course that would have been for the Famicom, but as the Famicom and the NES share essentially the same hardware, bar a few minor differences, you can play Famicom games on an NES with the use of like a flash cart, like an EverDrive. The next reason to go NTSC is video. As NTSC runs at 60 fields per second, and when you're dealing with something like the NES, which outputs more of a progressive type signal, you actually get 60 frames per second. This is opposed to PAL, where you have 50 fields per second, or with something like this, 50 frames. But I know some of you are probably saying, hey, doesn't PAL have more vertical resolution? And yes, while that's true, there is a higher resolution with PAL, it's not put to good use on something like the NES here. Instead, what you tend to end up with is letterboxing, where those extra lines at the top and bottom of the frame are just blank. This is opposed to NTSC, where the image actually fills the entire screen. The third reason to go NTSC is sound. Although most games will more or less sound correct if they're played on their original region console, there are some slight pitch differences between NTSC and PAL versions, and of course you've got the original Famicom which came with certain games that made use of expansion audio. This is not something that's found on the original NES, but it is pretty easy to re-enable that expansion audio with a small mod, and then you can use something like an EverDrive to play the Japanese release games with that expansion audio. The fourth and final reason is speed. Running an NTSC game on a PAL console results in some very odd side effects. The reason Mario appears to be running slower is because the power release games are actually sped up to run on PAL consoles. This is because the actual hardware in these consoles run at different speeds for PAL and NTSC. This becomes a real problem with later more advanced games that make use of mappers. Most mappers rely on fairly tight timing to pull off certain tricks with the NES, and when you're running at a completely different clock speed, things can go awry. So that covers the why. The next question is, how? Well, unfortunately with the NES, it's not as simple as just cutting a trace or bridging a jumper. There are actually three key components that make the console either PAL or NTSC. They are the CPU, the PPU, and the crystal. Now at this point you might be thinking, why not just import an NTSC console and be done with it? Well, I could do that, but it'd end up being pretty expensive, and really, where's the fun in that? Of course, that means that I need to actually source these components, and yeah, getting the crystal is easy, but the CPU and the PPU? Yeah, not so much. Now I did have a look online to see if anyone had tried this before and potentially ran into any issues, and I didn't really find all that much. One thing I did find, however, was the list of CPUs and PPUs that were used in the Famicom and the NES. And there are a couple there made by UMC that caught my eye. They are the UA6527P and the UA6538. These are both chips made by UMC for compatibility with NTSC games on PAL systems. So I thought, well, that sounds kind of interesting, it's worth looking into. So I had a look on AliExpress, and it turns out these chips are quite cheap. And they were a hell of a lot cheaper than the official NTSC chips, which were made by Ryko. But of course this is AliExpress, so I had no idea what was going to show up, so just in case I ordered two of each. And a few weeks later, this is what showed up. Of course, the X wasn't originally on that chip, I put that on there because naturally one of them didn't work. Thankfully though, I had two working PPUs and one working CPU, so I could at least try out this experiment to put this NTSC compatibility to the test. Now of course swapping out the CPU and PPU does require desoldering these chips, they're not normally in sockets, and of course if you're a beginner at soldering, I'd highly recommend practicing on junk boards before you try it on anything that you actually care about. Of course, as I've already been experimenting with this, these chips are now installed in sockets. So with the original PAL chips out, we can throw in a working CPU and PPU combination. 
We do need to keep the original crystal as these chips are designed to run with the PAL master clock frequency and the console still outputs a PAL video signal. So with those installed my hope was that PAL games would still work as normal and NTSC games would now run at the right speed and we wouldn't have any more graphical glitches. What I got however is a different story. In terms of PAL games, they still ran at the right speed and everything seemed normal, but listen to that audio. There is also a bunch of noise in the form of diagonal lines across the screen that wasn't present with the original chips. So not quite the result I was hoping for with PAL games, but if NTSC games now worked, maybe I can make an exception. Let's see how that went. So I fired up the NTSC version of Super Mario Bros. and yeah, it's still slow, it still looks like shit, and it still sounds like shit. Not off to a good start. So at this point it was looking pretty bad, but I thought well we should at least still try Castlevania 3, the Japanese version, just to see if it fixed those graphical issues. And as you can see at the top of the screen, they're better, but they're still not perfect. And of course we've still got that slowdown and the terrible audio and video. So I think the only right thing to do is take these chips out and throw them in the dead parts bin. Even though they may still technically work, I don't think anyone wants to be subject to that again. So at this point I thought I'm just going to have to either buy an NTSC console or buy the original NTSC chips to stick in this one. And then I started thinking about the other console in this mix, the Famicom. As I mentioned earlier, the Famicom shares very similar hardware with the NES. In fact, from what I could gather, the CPU and the PPU in the Famicom are the exact same ones found in the NTSC NES. So a plan started to form, and back to eBay I went. Yep, I bought five of them. I've always kind of wanted a Famicom, so I guess that's checked off the list, and I figured five should be more than enough to get at least one working Famicom and a spare CPU and PPU for the NES. These three at the back I haven't even touched, so I don't know if any of them work, and I'm thinking we might save them for a future video. Let's just focus on the two that I have opened up, and I'll explain what I found. So this is the first one that I opened up, and despite what that X might have you believe, this does actually work. In fact, I borrowed some Famicom games off Mr. Lurch, and it booted up and played Mario just fine. So I figured I was in luck. I desoldered the PPU and the CPU and also the crystal, which I haven't soldered back in, and stuck them into the NES. So with our new chips installed and the crystal swapped over, I powered on the NES and this is what I got. So uh, you may already spot the issue. Yeah. Invisible Mario. And invisible Goombas. So I thought, ah, silly me, I'm running a PAL game on an NTSC system, of course there's going to be issues. Let's swap over to the NTSC version. But after putting in the EverDrive, I was greeted with this. And I thought, that's pretty weird, I'm pretty sure the EverDrive works on NTSC, unless it's like a different firmware that it needs. But no, there is no other firmware, and yes, it should work on NTSC. And at this point I started questioning if I had all this correct and if I just wasted a bunch of money on buying five Famicoms. So I pulled apart another one, tested that it worked and it seemed to be fine, and once again desoldered the CPU and PPU, and this time stuck the CPU and PPU from the first Famicom into this one. And I got the same graphical glitches, but this time with the original Famicom cartridge. So that's when I figured one or possibly both of these chips from the first Famicom must be bad. And after a combination of swapping in and out different chips, I found that it was the CPU from the first Famicom that was causing the issue. So I threw a big X on it, but I may have jumped the gun because I actually reinstalled this back into the first Famicom where it came from and it worked again. I even went as far as taking these two chips and putting them in the first Famicom, they also worked. But whenever I put this CPU into this board, I get that issue, and likewise with the NES. So not to get too bogged down in Famicom stuff, but it does seem like there is some kind of subtle difference between these two boards that allows this particular CPU to work in this one, and not this one. I'm suspecting it may be something with the supporting logic and the revision of this particular chip, but like I said, we're not going to get too deep into Famicom stuff in this video, so we'll save that for another time. What I will do, however, is take this X off. Let's just replace that with something a bit less certain. 
So seeing as these chips in the second Famicom didn't seem to mind what machine they were installed in, I had high hopes for them working in the NES. So with our NTSC chips and NTSC crystal, I powered on the NES and this is what I got. Loading up the NTSC version of Super Mario Bros. worked as expected and now we have it in full screen and it runs at the original speed and not the slightly faster speed that we actually ended up with on PAL consoles. Of course if we load up the PAL version everything now runs too fast. Like I said before the PAL games actually run faster than the NTSC ones so we get the opposite effect of running an NTSC game on a PAL console. But that's all well and good for Super Mario Brothers. it didn't really have any issues before apart from running a little bit slow. What about Castlevania 3? Well as you can see and hear it works perfectly. This is the Japanese version of course so we've got the expansion audio working, we don't have any graphical glitches, it's running at the right speed and it's in full screen. So I'd call that a total win and finally we have a successful conversion. Of course it does come at the cost of a Famicom but most of these are in pretty rough shape so I think it's okay to sacrifice one for the team. I do see one more thing we need to take care of. There we go. So I think the only thing left to do now is reassemble this thing. Here we go. Oh, one more issue. There we go. It's uh, not quite a perfect match, but it's a couple of bucks off AliExpress, so uh, can't expect too much. So that's it. I now have an NTSC NES, so I guess I've got a whole lot more games to check out, and uh, they'll all be in full screen and play at the original intended speed. I think the only downside is the video output, which seems to be slightly worse with NTSC due to that dot crawl. But I can live with that for now, just bust out an old CRT and enjoy. Uh, that is of course until we hopefully get LumaCode for the NTSC NES and then well we'll look at doing another HDMI mod. But for now I'm just happy to have an NTSC console. So um, that is it for this one, leave any thoughts or comments down below and uh, thank you all for watching, a huge thanks to the people that support the channel on Patreon and help me to continue making videos like this and coming up with new crazy ideas. Maybe not as crazy as some of the things I've seen on YouTube, but crazy enough. Um, yeah, that is it for me. Thank you all for watching. Bye.